uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 9. Gospel of not John, chapter 9. The story of a sign that Jesus did. You know, every one of Jesus' miracles is real. Jesus did miracles. And he still does miracles. He healed the sick and he raised the dead. And cleansed the lepers. He cast out evil spirits. Every last one of those are real. And that record of them in the Bible is for a specific reason. They, number one, God wants you to know that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And whatever he did back then, he still does today. Because he told his church to pray for people in his name and he would do whatever they asked in his name so uh, the miracles are, uh, you know God does miracles all the time okay God does miracles all the time Jesus is the same yesterday today and forever but there's different words in the Bible for the miracles like in the three gospels they they use a word that means power works of power but in John he uses a unique word it's signs the miracles are signs well what does a sign do the sign points to something greater. So you see a sign, Cedar Rapids, 30 miles. Well, that sign's not Cedar Rapids. It's pointing to a city down the road, 30 miles, okay? And all the, all the miracles in John are signs because every one of them points to something greater. They, they speak to the human condition. This is the sign of the healing of a blind man. But as you see, it talks about greater issues, see? Because uh, I'd hate, well, I'd hate to be blind. I really hate to be blind. I mean, I've often thought of it. How much of my life is, you know, enjoying the beauty of God. You walk out at night and you see the stars and stuff like that. I mean, I just, I just could I can't fathom that. I'd have to adjust, I suppose. I hope I never go blind. But uh, I'd hate to be blind. And if you're blind, you know, you hear... Uh, you may overhear someone say, look at that rainbow. But it doesn't mean anything to you. You can't even register with you. You don't know what they're talking about. Or someone says, look at the stars tonight. And you're, not, you're out of the conversation. It doesn't even mean a thing. Okay. Uh, because you're blind and you can't even participate in that experience. And you have no point of reference for it. All right. Well, that healing of the physical blindness actually it points to an even worse blindness. Could there be a worse blindness? Yes, spiritual blindness. Spiritual blindness. Someone says, you know what, I just met Jesus. That doesn't mean a thing to you. It doesn't touch anything in you. Okay. Someone, someone says, uh, you know, we just said Kathy died and went to heaven. Spiritually blind. Come on. Doesn't even touch. And the most important part about you is your spiritual life. And if you're spiritually blind, what's the Bible say? If the blind follow the blind, they will both end up in the pit. Okay. It's so there's, this is what this story points to, and I'll show you that. There, there, but before I read it, there, there's a proverb I keep quoting lately, and it says that the, the, the path of the just is as the shining of the light unto the perfect day. And you're supposed to use your imagination, that proverb. You see you're heading out early morning. You're on a path. You're going somewhere. But you just got a little crack of light. But it's enough to see. You can avoid any pit boil falls. You won't trip over any rocks or, or roots. And you move along. But as you move along, the sun comes up and the light comes clearer. It's just as clear <coughs> by noon. <coughs> and it's as clear as it could ever get. He says that's the way it is with your spiritual life if you're saved. You just get just a little light at first. But if you continue on, the sun goes up. All right? And ultimately, we're headed for the perfect day. What happens in the perfect day? You see everything as it really is. 
you see everything as it really is. Now, the wicked are on a path too. The same Proverbs says the way of the wicked is his darkness. The wicked, the path goes a different way though. They, got, they do have light. Every single person that ever born in this world has enough light that they're going to be accountable for. But their path is the sun going down and it getting darker and darker. He says that he who hates his brother is in darkness and doesn't even know what he stumbles over. And ultimately, it's black. Total blindness. One time, somebody took me down to a gold mine in South Africa. He said, you want an experience? I'll show you an experience. And we walked a mile zigzag underground. When we got about a mile down, they turned off all the lights. And I'm telling you, it creeped me. Because you ever heard the expression, darkness that can be felt? Oh, man, I said, get the lights on. I had enough. I had enough. And I was relieved when they turned the lights on. I thought about what Jesus said about hell. Depart from me, you that work in iniquity, into outer darkness, reserved for the devil and his angels. See, everybody's on a path, and some people are going into greater light. You get, by the way, you can never stay the way you are. You can't stay the same. You become more of whatever you were yesterday. So if you're on the one path, man, you're in deeper darkness than you were a year ago. Ultimately, it's, the end is total darkness. If we're on the other path, things are coming clearer. You're starting to see. The sun's shining. We aren't quite there, but we're almost at the, the full day. On that day, everything will be seen as it really is, not as it pretended to be. And there's nothing hidden that will not be revealed. Okay, this is another sermon entirely, but be careful of hypocrisy. It's short-sighted. Sooner or later, everything will be revealed. Whatever's real is what's going to come out. So you may as well just be real now. Amen? <laughs> Beware of hypocrisy. It's self-delusion. Here's how the story illustrates it. Let me read a few verses and then talk. Talk you through John 9. As Jesus passed by, he saw himself. Oh, wait, though. Look at John 8, 59, the verse before. Then they took up stones to cast at him. That's Jesus. They were going to kill him. But Jesus hid himself. Jesus hid, hid himself. Okay. We got a God that hides himself. Part of the reason why he wants us to seek him. He wants to draw out of us faith. Longing. Holy longing. So Jesus hid himself, went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Okay, that's a common question. What did he do wrong, or what did his parents do wrong, that he's been punished this way? And if you want to find out where someone went wrong, you couldn't go back far enough. That's a waste of time. Where did I go wrong? What did I do wrong? If only I hadn't read that dirty book in seventh grade or smoked pot in eighth. Okay. You can't go back far enough. Where'd you go wrong? In the garden. When Adam sinned, brought in a whole principle of futility into this world. It's a waste of time. And no light is going to come really from the past in that sense. You won't figure anything out. You won't be anything better off. So Jesus doesn't even answer it. Instead he says, uh, neither, uh, neither hath this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God should be manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day. The night comes when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Okay, look. It's a waste of time to go into the past. He doesn't even answer it. 
She says, not this guy or his parents that sinned. You'd have to go all the way back to the beginning to find out where it all went wrong. But that's a waste of time in this case. He says, look, I'm here to do the works of him that sent me. And that's the one designation about Jesus and John. Over and over, the Father sent him. The Father sent the Son to do a specific work. And what is the work of Jesus? He said, the reason I came into this world is to bear witness to the truth. All who are of the truth will hear my voice. Are you of the truth? Have you been born again of the truth? And then he spit on the ground and picked up the clay and the spittle. And he did like this. He'd done it before. When? Back in the garden. He made a man's body out of clay and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. In this case, he's making a new eyeball. Amen. And he anoints the man's eyes Amen. with this spit clay. And he sends him, go down to the pool of Siloam. Now the word Siloam means the sent one. Go wash in the pool of Siloam and you will see. Go wash in the pool of the one sent by the Father. Go wash in the pool of Jesus. I remember how my eyes were open yes. after my baptism. All of a sudden. There's even stuff natural. I thought, wow, I never noticed birds before. And stars. It's too caught up in myself. As I was looking down. But you were made. So the man had to make his way to the pool of Siloam. And washed. And he got, and he got his sight back. Not so hard to fathom that. It'd be shocking really. All of a sudden. The light reflecting on the water. The curtains around the pool. People just probably sh freaked out. He came back and his neighbors, verse 8, therefore, and they which before had seen him that was blind said, isn't this the one that sat and begged? Oh, he's so new that even his friends don't recognize him at first. Now, some of you have had that experience. What happened to you? What happened to you? A new man. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, right? They go, was that really him? And I heard that before. Is that really him? So in some cases it goes like this. That's just a phase he's going through. He's going through a church phase. We'll get him back down to the, the clubs in no time, right? Is that really him or, or is this someone else? And so this is he. Some said this is he, verse 9. Others said he's like him, but he said no, it's me. <laughs> Therefore said to end him, then how were your eyes opened? Now listen to his answer. He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus, he made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. I went and washed. And then I received my sight. Well, it's all true. But it's not completely true. Because Jesus really is a man but how many know Jesus is more than a man but he couldn't see that well yet it's like the light of the first light it's a dim light who is Jesus by the way that's the most important thing of all who is Jesus because every one of you will be judged on that your relationship to Jesus that's the judgment, whether or not you're rightly related to Jesus. And all your sins and everything, they, they do not have to damn you. No matter what you've done evil against God, it does not have to damn you if you come into right relationship with Jesus. But you must have your eyes open to who Jesus is. And that light can only come from above. That guy was not looking for that, but it came to him. I wasn't looking, but he hit me right between the eyes. A man that's called Jesus. When they said to him, where is he? He goes, I don't know. I don't know. 
So they brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. Verse 13. Now the Pharisees do kind of get a bad rap. People don't get the Pharisees because they think they're just horribly evil, fire-breathing demons. And therefore they miss the point that the Pharisees are a warning to us. Who are the Pharisees, really? Not as far away from you as you think. The Pharisees were the ones that are theologically closest to Jesus. The Pharisees were the back to the Bible movement of their day. Only they went wrong. The whole thing started to resist the worldliness called Hellenism that was sweeping the world. So they said our goal is to keep all 613 commandments of God. You can't condemn that. But the man cannot be saved in the flesh. See, I'm saying that because people read the Pharisees. Oh yeah, black hats, terrible people. Oh no, it's a warning to us. That's why they're all over the Bible. You think he just gave us someone to hate? No, he's warning you. It can happen to the best of them. They brought him to the Pharisees that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Well, the law of God says, six days shall you labor and the seventh be the rest. The Pharisees, in their zeal to keep the law of God, wrote commentaries about every one of the commandments. And in their commentaries, they would ask questions like, what is work? How much can I lift? How far can I walk? By the time they were done, there were 1,200 commandments around the Sabbath alone. Let's put it this way. You were so glad when the weekend was over. You couldn't believe it. <laughs> I need to rest. I need to get back to work. <laughs> See, this is what people do with the Bible. They butcher it and destroy its meaning and strip it of its benefit for that law was such a blessing six days shall you lay yeah but the seventh you get to rest because you're not a slave now what's that make you if you feel like you have to work seven days a week now a slave so it's a trial it's an investigation by authority an investigation into a miracle by unbelief and here's what they say. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he received his sight. How did you get your sight back? You know, wouldn't, wouldn't you think you'd be going, Wow! Praise God! This guy is blind! No. They're looking for details. So that they can discount it. So they can discount Jesus. Amen. See, that's the meaning of spiritual darkness. It's not being ignorant, for no one can be faulted for being ignorant. It's deliberately closing the shades because you instinctively know what the light might reveal and what the light might demand of you. So you pretend. It's better to pretend you don't know and to find fault with the Bible so you won't be bothered by its message. Like Mark Twain once said, it's not the parts of the Bible that I don't understand that bother me. It's the parts I do understand. So he says, and then as the Pharisees, tell us! He said unto them, well, he put clay on my eyes and I wash and do see. And the Pharisees said, and then therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God. Why? Because he doesn't keep the Sabbath day. Well, even in the law of God, it said if, you're, if your ox falls into a ditch on the Sabbath day, you've got permission to go get your ox out of the ditch. If someone gets sick on the Sabbath day, a doctor has a right to treat them. But according to their 1,200 sub-laws, see, they could just dismiss Jesus. Now listen to me. That's what this evil generation is doing. They dismiss Jesus. Now it's Easter time, perhaps the highest and holiest holiday of all Christians. And where do you see the cover of Time and Newsweek? Because they will no doubt have a picture of Jesus on there and go and tell everyone 
how he didn't exist, how he wasn't really claiming to be God. Everything, I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy. Okay, they want to dismiss it. That's darkness. He said, therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God. He doesn't keep the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. Light always divides. Light has divided us. Light has divided you. Salvation is division because he says, come out of them. Come out of them and be my people. And the light of God divides people. It doesn't unite. It divides. Because there are some that accept the light and some that reject the light. So the light divided them. They say unto the blind man again, what do you say of him that has opened my eyes? Look what he says next. He's a prophet. Ah, stronger light. First he said he's a man. No way, he's more than a man, he's a prophet. He's a prophet. He speaks for God. God speaks through him. But the Jews didn't believe concerning him. That he had been blind. Oh, we don't believe you were blind. And received his sight. Until they called the parents of him that received his sight. And they asked him saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? I'm trying to imagine your son is born blind. The heartache. I mean, he's literally reduced to begging by the temple. And now the parents are sitting there with that same son he sees. As a parent, you'd be overjoyed, I think, anyway. He'd be like, oh, hallelujah, oh, praise God. But look, darkness is not just a spiritual state, it's a kingdom. And the kingdom of darkness is ruled by fear. And the parents knew that if they had any praise for Jesus, they would be excommunicated out of the temple. And that, was the, that, in effect, is barring them from access to God. They're terrified. How terrified? So terrified that they can't even rejoice in their son's healing. We don't know. You're telling me they don't know? <laughs> we don't know who it was or who opened his eyes. We don't know. He's of age. Ask him. He'll speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. Now this is a really relevant story to our time because I'm going to tell you something. Political correctness is a kind of heightened fear of man. And the Bible says the fear of man is causes a snare. And the way it's working, the what the leaders of the world are actually doing to people is not only do they want to shut up Christianity and her, our morals and ethics, they want to take it a step further. They want to force you to confess to things that you know are not true on many, many issues. The gay marriage issue, the Muslim, you're supposed to say that it's a religion of peace. On so many issues, there's so much pressure and so this is a very relevant story because the kingdom of darkness operates by fear. And the only, the only way to be free of the fear really, truly, it's counterintuitive, is to step out into the light. So he says he's a prophet. And so it says uh, in verse 22, these words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. That tells you what kind of investigation this is. This decision's already made. The verdict's already in. There's not no real inquiry. Okay. That's the way a lot of people are. They will not surrender to God already. Therefore said his parents, he's of age, ask him. 24, then again they called the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. They're literally putting him under oath there. We put you under oath, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. 
Who? It's who they talk about. Jesus. Give God the glory. First they said, this man broke the Sabbath. Now they say, this man is a sinner. First, the blind man says, a man touched my eyes. Then he says, a prophet. The one is going into greater light and the other is going into deeper darkness. And I dare say that both of these are true of everyone in this room. You cannot be static. You are going into greater light or deeper darkness. They put him under oath. By, in the name of God, admit that this man's a sinner. He answered and said, verse 25, whether he be a sinner or not, I don't know. I want you to see a, a, dif a difference here. The Pharisees are speaking as authorities. That's one of the problems of spiritual darkness. If you think you're already the expert, then what left is there for you to learn? If you take the posture of an expert, come on, we put you under oath. We know he's a sinner. Tell it. You're only going to go deeper into darkness. But notice this man's posture. He's not an expert. Just a witness. Hey, this is what happened to me. This is what happened to me. Like the good old song says, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Man, I did not know. I tell you, I did not know. There was a whole world of born-again Christians. I did not know about the body of Christ. That there's people all over the world by faith in Jesus who just love so much and give so freely. Now I know. I always pinch myself and say, oh gosh, if the sinners could know the beauty of this life, man. Wow. I just didn't know about scripture. I had no idea. I started reading the Bible because I realized one night that I, ne I was illiterate, I said, because I never read the Bible. I had no idea. I was so blind. And the little glimmer of light came. And he called me to just walk after that light. Don't ever forsake it. Don't ever forsake it. And now, it's like the sun coming up. <laughs> We're almost there at the perfect day. And one of the things about the sun coming up for us, you see something that the kings of the earth and the rulers could never see, even though they're trying to solve the problems of the world. The least Christian knows more than them. They are literally blind guides stumbling over each other. You can see, but who's going to listen to you and me, right? Let me go back to my text here. So they put him under oath, and he says, All I know is what I experienced. I was blind, now I see. Then they said to him again, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? But it's not an honest inquiry. They're not really wanting to believe in him. They don't really want to know. And notice there's no referencing scripture. They're looking for something. Some reason to reject him. Maybe I'm talking to you today. You look for something to justify. Ah, it's just all a crock. He answered them, I already told you and you didn't hear. Why would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? So he's getting cheeky. Then they reviled him and said, you're his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. And they were really deceived. They actually were ser serious there. They thought they were. If they really, really, really believe Moses, instantly they believe in Jesus. But that's how deception works. You know, the worst kind of deception is self-deception. You don't need the devil. You already deceive yourself half the time. Because we tell ourselves what we want to hear. 
and we have these a priori, a priori uh, investigations where the decision's already made, we're just trying to find something to supplement our will. He says, we know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he comes from. That's what Larry says. We don't know where he comes from. Now, if you know the story, I mean, you know that there's more to that than meets the eye because what they're saying, they're referencing his birth. Remember, Jesus was born of a virgin. And everybody knew that there was questionable events around his birth. And birth is a very important thing to Jewish claims to Messiahship. You've you got to prove that you come from the line. So what they're really saying is, we know God spoke to Moses, but we also know that this man is a bastard. That's what they're saying. This man is a bastard. So they go from saying he's broke the Sabbath to he's a sinner to he's a bastard. See, this is the descent into deeper darkness. And this generation's well on its way. It's terrifying, really, huh? The man answered and said to them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that you know not where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. Now we know that God will not hear sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he hears. That's pretty good theology, you know that? Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. And they answered and said unto him, you were all together born in sins, and you're going to teach us? And they threw him out. They excommunicated him. Now look, I'm telling you, excommunication is a serious thing, okay, in those days. That, that, that'd be fearful. That'd make you a living leper, because the whole community revolved around worship in the temple and everything like that. And the fear of man is very binding. But you can see the willful ignorance in the very face of evidence. But look at the grip of the world, like on his parents. And then excommunication, they're going to shut the door to God on this man. But little did any of them know that very shortly, with the resurrection of Jesus, a new door would be opened to God for everybody. Amen? Amen? How many are glad for that open door? Amen. See, that's why in the next chapter, Jesus says, look, I'm the door. I'm the door. If anyone can come through me, they get, they get to God. I'm the door. These are the shepherds. They throw them out. Jesus said, no, I'm the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. And they follow me. Now let me move on. I'm going to close shortly. Famous last words, right? Jesus heard that they cast him out. And when he found him, he said unto him, Do you believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, You have both seen him, and it is he that talketh of thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Think of, his, think of his progress. He went from a man, a prophet, a person that did good and feared God. But then at the end of the chapter, Jesus comes to him. Do you believe on the Son of God? Who is he, Lord? He's still not an expert. He's still a seeker. Who is he, Lord? Well, you're talking to him. And he made the confession. Yea, Lord, I believe. And he did what we did this morning. He worshipped Jesus. Talk about light, huh? But what about the others? Well, they went from deciding right away, this man is not of God. He's a sinner. And then he said, worse, he's a bastard. He couldn't be of God. False prophet. The darkness deepens. 
just like in our age. There is no darkness. There is no blindness like willful blindness, like the refusal to see, because they know instinctively what the light will eventually reveal, and they back away from that so heavily. No, 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 get me out of here. Get me out of here. What does it mean to walk in darkness? It's the cloud of self-deception that people surround themselves with. Self-justification at any cost. Defensiveness. The whirlwind of defensiveness by which the guilty hide themselves. It's shutting the curtains and closing the shades and blocking out the light of the world. Remember, he said, we must work while it's light. There is a time element. Hey, everybody, there is a time element. You don't know how much time you have to come into the light. That's what salvation is. It's getting your eyes open. It's coming to the light. And there's certain things that you can't see until he opens your eyes. You can't see who Jesus really is. So someone doesn't get it. They don't get the big deal about Jesus. But when their eyes are open, or someone get the big deal about your sins. My sins, oh the, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. Well, a lot of people don't realize how serious their sins are. How bad the leprosy is, how far spread it is, and how fatal forever yeah. sin is. Yeah. But oh man, when his light comes. Because in the light we not only see God, but we see ourselves as we truly are. And that's unnerving for some. But we have found that if you stay in the light, then the same light that exposes everything. See, a lot of people don't like church for that reason. They think it's the people. Oh, they're judging me for what I wore. You're not that important that everyone's looking at you. But I know why you feel that way. God's in church. And wherever God is, light is. And wherever light is, people see themselves. And sometimes it can be disconcerting, man. It can be uncomfortable. The instinct is, get me out of here. They're judging me. Oh, we're not judging you. We're too busy judging ourselves. <laughs> but God's here. Where God is, there's light. And if you stay in the light, the same light that exposes everything will purge you and make you holy. Let's read the last three verses and then I'll close. And Jesus said, for judgment, I'm come into this world. That they which see not, they which see not, might see. And they which see might be made blind. See, it's not a difference between people that can see and people who can't see. It's the difference between people who know they're blind and people who think they see. <laughs> That's the best posture, oh Lord, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Teach me. And one of the Pharisees, which were with him, heard these words. He said, are we blind also? Are you say we're blind? It's shocking to him because this is how deception works. The Pharisees were the experts. Shocking. You're telling me we're blind? What? Nobody thinks we're blind. We're the only ones who can see. Listen to Jesus' answer. He said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now you say, We see. Therefore your sin remains. What's he saying? Oh, if only you were blind. But because you say that you see then what can be done about your sins you are already the expert you already know everything therefore father in the name of jesus if this whole message was for one person it's worth it if you could just show one person the truth about their spiritual blindness then it'd be worth it all Father, shine your light into the hearts. There's no one that's here by accident. You brought us all here together. 
you gave this message. I just pray that you shine the true light that lightens everyone. I pray that you bring us into the full light of day. If there's anyone that slipped off the path and is going the other way into the sundown, I pray that you jar them loose and put them right back on the right path. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.